Hi, we're the Knot Theory Group of the small REU at Williams College. Our talk is about estimating link volumes via subdivision. I'm Darren, a rising senior at Williams. To begin, let me give a very brief introduction to knot theory. We can picture a knot as a string that we put a knot into and then glue the ends together. Let's look at an example. On the left here is the 7 4 knot. It's a knot that displays beautiful symmetries, hence, it's a widely admired Buddhist symbol. On the right here is the Borromean rings. These are links. Informally speaking, links are knots that are mutually entangled. In fact, knots are simply links of one component. The links here are named after Italian aristocrats, the House of Borromeo. Okay, end of history lesson. Those previous examples are what we call projections of knots and links. We allow three modifications on projections. We call these modifications Reitermeister moves. Would you believe that these two knots are equivalent by Reitermeister moves? Probably not, you'd say. But who says if 10 million moves down the line, the two knots do turn out to be equivalent? This problem motivates a principal inquiry, distinguishing knots. To do this, we use invariants. Invariants are quantities that help us distinguish knots but the invariants themselves are preserved under Reitermeister moves. Okay, one more thought. In 1978, Bill Thurston proved a big theorem that knots can be classif classified into one of three, three categories, torus knots, satellite knots, or hyperbolic knots. We like hyperbolic knots because they have an important associated invariant. Jack will talk more about that. Thanks, sir. I'm Jack, and I'm a rising senior at Boston College. If we imagine knots and links floating in three space, we can also consider their complements. Link complements are a class of three manifolds, which are topological spaces that locally look like Euclidean three space. The boundary components of a link complement are the tori obtained by slightly thickening the components of the link. We are not restricted to taking link complements in only Euclidean three space. We can also construct three manifolds by taking the complement of a link in a solid or thickened surface. In general, manifolds are topological objects, but they often possess geometric structures as well. A hyperbolic manifold is formally defined as a complete Riemannian manifold with constant sectional curvature minus one. What this really means is that near each point in a hyperbolic manifold, the geometry appears as an hyperbolic space. As we can see on the slide, the shortest path between two points in hyperbolic space is not necessarily a straight line segment. A hyperbolic structure on a manifold allows us to assign to it a positive real number called volume, which might be infinite. The Mostow rigidity theorem asserts that for finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds, volume is a topological invariant. We are particularly interested in certain types of surfaces which appear in three manifolds for reasons that will become clear soon. One important type of surface is an essential surface, which we don't define here, but we give an example. Another important type of surface is a totally geodesic one. These can be thought of as respecting the hyperbolic structure of the ambient three manifold. Totally geodesic surfaces can be identified as a fixed, fixed point set of reflections of the three manifold. One reason essential surfaces are important is because of a result to the Thurston that enables one to show a manifold as hyperbolic of finite volume by eliminating essential tori, annuli, and spheres. As Darren mentioned earlier, there is a distinction between hyperbolic and satellite knots. This is exactly because of an essential torus preventing hyperbolicity. Many knots are hyperbolic, and hyperbolic volume is a topological invariant by Mostow rigidity, so in many cases we can use volume to distinguish knots. Here are the volumes associated to two simple knots. In addition to computing explicit volumes, it is also useful to apply volume bounds to hyperbolic three manifolds. There is an existing lower bound for links due to Lacken v, which uses an invariant of links called twisting number. However, the bound is restricted to alternating links in the three sphere and is weak in practice. A more general tool for volume bounds is due to a result of Eagle Thurston's storm, which states that when a three manifold is cut along a totally geodesic surface and reglued, its volume either stays the same or increases. Hi, I'm Natalie. I'm a rising senior at MIT. And I'd like to describe, now that we have those foundations, and especially Storm Thurston, a particular class of links living in a solid torus. Uh, suppose they're constructed in such a way. You begin 
with a cyclic graph on end nodes embedded in a longitude of the torus, of the solid torus. Uh, on each node, you fill in a tangle, which formally is just a collection of uh, disjoint arcs and circles. And between each tangle, you connect uh, for these edges a finite number of strands, such that the whole thing pastes together into a, a bona fide link in the solid torus. We want to study the link and especially the hyperbolicity and hyperbolic volume of it using associated properties of the individual tangles. Um, so in order to do that, well, I'll, I'll say it, we're, we're going to define hyperbolicity and volume of an individual tangle. Um, and we're going to do so by bootstrapping those uh, invariants from how we've defined them for links. So given a tangle, we define a canonical link in a solid torus called its double by essentially take, uh, doubling across the top and bottom of the cylinder and reflecting it across this. So if the, if the associated link, the double, is hyperbolic, then we say that the tangle is hyperbolic, in which case we define the volume of the tangle to be half of the volume of the double. So this is constructed in a fundamentally nice way, right? There's this symmetry across the middle. Um, and this reflection fixes that middle totally geodesic surface over which we can use Agle Storm Thurston, cut and paste, and preserve hyperbolicity and, and give up lower bounds on volumes. We use this to prove the following theorem, that if a link decomposes into a collection of hyperbolic tangles, then the link itself was hyperbolic and its volume is lower bounded by the sum of the volumes of the tangles. Um, and this is kind of a fundamentally new kind of result in that this is very inductive and looks at like very local blind like sections of it, which is kind of different in flavor from other lower bounds that are known for link volumes. So I'll give a sketch of a proof. What we do essentially is that um, First, we say that you can conglomerate two adjacent hyperbolic tangles, and it will give you a hyperbolic tangle. Its volume will be lower bounded by the sums of the volumes. Then once you've done that enough times that you have only one left, you have essentially the same theorem, but for a decomposition into a single hyperbolic tangle. And we'll give a proof of this second lemma, although the first is essentially the same. They're both proof by pictures. Uh, but first, I'll need to develop this one basic theorem that covering maps work well with hyperbolicity and volume. Essentially, an n-fold cover means that you have a finite volume on the uh, total space whose volume is n times the volume of the base space. So once we have this, uh, suppose that a link decomposes into a single hyperbolic tangle, we're going to give the theorem. So we do this exactly as described before. Uh, those orange surfaces, totally geodesic, so we cut and paste along them and we get a double cover. So using our previous work, this gives us precisely the hyperbolicity and the lower bound that we described as such. Hi, I'm Mikele. I'm a rising senior at Case Western Reserve University. Another extension of these concepts is the idea of square tangles. A square tangle is a projection of a tangle that we will consider to be living in a square where each of the sides of the tangle has a collection of strands that meets each edge of our square. We have found various of these square tangles in a variety of geometric objects. Um, the main one that we have is the cube, but we've also found in a wedge or even a gyro bifastigium, which is just an excuse to use the concept of a gyro bifastigium. Um, we will mainly be focusing, however, on the cubicle um, square tangles. In particular, we have found the following theorem, which if you consider a link in a thickened torus that decomposes into an n by n grid of square tangles, then the volume of that n by m grid is greater than or equal to a fourth of the volume of its, the quadruple of each individual square tangle. And the cube in question here is if you take your thickened torus, cut alongside it so you get a thickened cylinder, then the square tangle will be living in that thickened cylinder as a little cross section. In particular, when we talk about the quadruple of a square tangle, what we mean is on the right side, you can see that it's reflected downwards and then reflected across. So you get four matching for each of those, for each specific tangle. And we want to be considering a collection of these, in particular an N by M collection, or in the simple case, a one by two collection. Um, a, the simple case to prove, however, is the one by two collection. And we will focus on this so we can see how the proof works out in the N by M grid. So if you consider the volume of the quadruples, 
you can see that they're totally geodesic surfaces. And as before, if you cut alongside these totally geodesic surfaces and glue it back together in a non-trivial way, the volume can't go down. So it has to either go up or stay the same. So in particular, if you flip the quadruple of T2, then when you glue it back together, you have these totally geodesic surfaces that run along vertically. And if you flip the middle again, you get T1, T2, T1, T2, and then it's reflection across the bottom, which is another totally geodesic surface. So if you flip alongside that, you get something which is the fourfold cover of T1 and T2, and that is exactly four times the volume of the T1, T2 um, tangle in the thickened torus. And using this, we can extend this to the n by m grid in a very similar argument that just requires a bit more machinery. My name is Miranda. I'm a student at Williams College. So far, we have looked at classes of links living in a solid torus or in a thickened torus. We can perform the same trick for a class of links living in S3, which is just three space plus a point at infinity. The question becomes, where can we find totally geodesic surfaces along which to cut up a link in S3? Now remember, reflection surfaces are totally geodesic. Say we had a reflection surface, then a link that respects it might look like this. To one side of the mirror, we have a tangle with some number of strands coming out its two sides. Doesn't have to be two strands on each side, like in the picture. Say we had another one of these, made from a different tangle. By the storm thurston theorem, we can cut at these reflection surfaces and glue the pieces back up, and we know that the volume of the result will go up or stay the same. In our example, we can place a cut down the middle of the necklace with a tangle T1 and its reflection, place another cut in the necklace with a T2 tangle and its reflection, and glue the four pieces back up to get two copies of a necklace with a T1 bead and a T2 bead. Then the volume of the T1, T2 necklace is greater or equal to the volume of the T1 bead plus the volume of the T2 bead. Now, can we do this with a longer necklace with more beads in it? It turns out that yes, we can do it. Here's the example with four beads. And in fact, we show that we can do this with any even number of beads in a necklace. Our theorem states that given a necklace link with two n beads, we can always obtain it by cutting open and gluing back up two n necklaces, each with, each with two n copies of the same bead in it. This implies that the volume of the necklace link is bounded below by the sum of the volume of its constituent beads. Let's look at an example of what we've been talking about. Say we want to know the volume of this link. It is prime and alternating, so the criteria for Lacombe's bound are satisfied. It is also a six bead necklace with two types of beads in it, five beads with four twists and one bead with five twists. So, with a table of the volume of the different beads, just by looking at the picture and doing some addition, I can give a lower bound on its volume. In this case, the Lacombe bound yields a volume of 2.02988, our bound yields a volume of 32.7858, while the actual volume turns out to be 32.9818. In this and many other examples, our bound seems to graze the actual volume really closely. Hello, I'm Alex. Uh, I'm a current student at Williams College. And I want to return to the case of the thickened torus and talk about a whole class of examples. So these theorems, um, that we talked about are a really, really cool way to cut up a, a link and look at the properties of the whole link based on its constituent parts. The only drawback is that these constituent parts have to be hyperbolic in order for our theorems to apply. So we've proven that a whole class of examples are hyperbolic. So in the thickened torus, we're going to talk about tangles that are in cylinders, which you can imagine are like half of a torus. Um, and recall, as Natalie defined, that a tangle is hyperbolic if it's double as hyperbolic. So we proved that a whole class of these are hyperbolic. And we call these specially alternating cylindrical tangles. This definition is quite a lot, and you are not expected to take in all of it. Uh, the basic idea is that each of these conditions are fairly easy to identify visually. So given a tangle, I can look at it and really quickly determine whether it is specially alternating or not. Um, 
And so let's go and take a look at an example. On the left, we have a specially alternating cylindrical tangle. Uh, we'll call it T1. And then on the right is its double, so in a torus. And note that the core curve is not drawn in either of these. That's just to make the pictures a little bit easier to, to see. Um, the volume of the double in this case is 34.726. So the volume of the tangle is half of that, which is 17.363. Taking a look at a second example, on the left is another specially alternating tangle. This one with volume 14.655. And when we put these two together, um, on the right, you see what we call their composition. Um, so I've glued them together to create a, a thickened torus. And you'll note that this is not a fully alternating projection because this strand here goes under and then under again, um, which is kind of neat because we've proven that this whole, that this thing is hyperbolic because of these individual parts are hyperbolic and not many classes of non-alternating links in the torus have been proven to be hyperbolic. And then if we examine the result that was talked about a little bit earlier, um, the volume of this link should be greater than the volume of the sum of the volume of the two constituent tangles. And indeed, we get the volume of the link as 38.947, um, which is greater than the sum, which is 32.018. So a resounding success. My name is Lily, and I am a rising junior at UC Berkeley. At this point, we've witnessed three ways of decomposing a link in a three manifold into simpler pieces, each equipped with a notion of hyperbolicity, and each piece contributes volume to the original link complement. There's a theme of filling in the blanks, going from a link made up of different tangles, simplifying down to links where all the slots are populated by the same tangle, just reflected. So it gives us a way to compute volumes locally and then summing to get a lower bound on the global volume. In this process, we rely on the symmetries inherited from the three manifold in the linking pattern to find totally geodesic surfaces to cut along and glue along. Um, of course, this is by our favorite theorem, Storm thurston In previous examples, we've exploited the symmetries of the solid torus, thickened torus, and the three-sphere. So a natural direction to go would be to find other three manifolds and linking patterns with sufficient symmetries to prove analogous results. So how much symmetry is enough symmetry? We conjecture that a graph on some three manifold will serve as a valid template for analogous results if the underlying graph is bipartite and for every edge of the graph, there's a symmetry in the manifold that switches its two vertices. For this strategy to work, by far the strongest condition we impose on the local pieces is in fact hyperbolicity. For, um, by, for example, asking for hyperbolic doubles or hyperbolic two and tuples. A further direction we'd like to pursue is how to loosen that condition. In particular, when we're decomposing a link, we often get a mixture of hyperbolic and non-hyperbolic pieces. It's a waste not to take the non-hyperbolic ones into account. So the question is, is there a way to compute volume contributed by a piece that doesn't even inherently have a notion of volume? In other words, if you hand us some tangle, can we determine a volume contribution just by looking at it? Another direction we've seen is especially alternating annulus tangles, a class of local pieces that are all hyperbolic. In other words, all their doubles are hyperbol hyperbolic in the thickened torus. We would like to have an analogous class of hyperbolic pieces in the square tangles case as well. A candidate is the special rational tangles made from this picture, um, from this picture and twisting adjacent ends together. So these are just some of the things we've been thinking about this summer and I, it's been great fun so far and hopefully you would agree with us that these are very fascinating things and we're excited that there are many interesting questions to pursue further in the future as well. And thank you for coming to our talk.